be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Walter Allen III began his law enforcement career in 1976 as a patrolman for the California State Fullerton University Police. From there, he would move on to the city of Chino, where he was a police officer. In 1981, he became a special agent for the California Department of Justice, the Bureau of Narcotics Enforcement. As a special agent and a special agent in charge, Walt perfected his skills in crime intelligence, tactics, combat firearms, and survival skills necessary to fight organized crime. Walt became known as an expert in these fields and traveled across the United States and to Mexico to provide certified narcotic officer training. The dangers of that job cannot be understated. As a testimony, it's a testimony to Walt's courage and tenacious work on behalf of justice. In 1985, as an example, one of Walt's associates, Kiki Camarena, an intelligence agent for the DEA, was kidnapped in Guadalajara and was brutally tortured and murdered by drug traffickers. Give you an idea how dangerous this job was that Walt was involved in. Walt's first retirement, I say first, <laughs> Walt's first retirement from law enforcement was in January of 2006 after more than 30 years of faithful service. But Walt couldn't find a rocking chair that would fit him. So he continues to serve in the variety of law enforcement and community service positions. He's currently the director of the Rio Hondo Police Academy in nearby Whittier. Walt earned his Bachelor of Science degree in urban planning at Cal Poly Pomona, and he's also a graduate of the FBI National Academy. Here are some past and present measure memberships. The California Peace Officers Association, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, Board Member and President of the California Narcotics Association, California Criminal Justice, I'm sorry, my phone is acting up, forgive me. <laughs> California Criminal Justice Council Association of Special Agents, Orange County Chiefs and Sheriff's Association, California Union of Safety Employees, NRA Life Member, Chairman Covina Gang Graffiti Task Force, LAPD Trap and Skeet Team, American Trap Shooting Association, Cal Poly Alumni Association, Board of Directors, Eddie Lee Youth and Family Services Board, Citrus Valley Health Partners Board, Metrolink Board of Directors, League of California Cities Public Safety Commission. He has uh, received a number of appointments over the years from three different governors of California, uh, Governors Pete Wilson, Gray Davis, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Some of those appointments were Director of the California Youth Authority, one of the largest youth correctional agencies in the nation, Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Advisory Board member, Assistant Secretary of the Office of Correctional Safety for the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, and Deputy Commissioner for the Board of Parole Hearings. Some of his awards and recognitions. Brace yourself. California Department of Justice, <laughs> the Medal of Meritorious Service, National We Tip Incorporated, Mayor of the Year, National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, Award of Merit for Outstanding Service to the Community, Western Region Alpha Award of Merit for Leadership and Community Service, Covina Chamber of Commerce and the City of Covina, Covina Citizen of the Year. Walt was first elected to the Covina City Council in 1997. It was following a, a very contentious year in Covina. Uh, four years earlier, all five members of the Covina City Council were recalled in a special election. First time in the history of the nation. And Covina made a lot of headlines about that. But thanks to Walt and others who came on board after that council uh, to settle the, uh, this terrible uh, tension that was in Covina and restore the council to decorum, uh, we've enjoyed a, uh, many, many good years since then. 
This very likable and community-minded man is currently serving his sixth four-year term as a city council member and past mayor of Covina. Walt played a significant role in changing California law to restrict the sale of cough medicines containing DXM. Young people had discovered these medicines taken in large quantities could mimic the effects of narcotics. Other states across the nation would follow with their own similar laws. He continues to openly lobby against California's early prison release programs brought on by our politicians in Sacramento through AB 109 and the voters of California through Propositions 47 and 57. From March of 1999 to March of 2003, I served on the Covina City Council with Walt, and during those four years of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder service, I was eyewitness to his strong commitment to the safety of Covina's citizens and businesses. I left the council with great respect for Mr. Allen. Proverbs 28.3 says this, Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. It's my honor to introduce to you tonight's keynote speaker, our Christian brother, my friend and associate, and one who understands justice completely, Covina City Council member, Walter Allen III. Thank you very much. Uh, since David did all the talking, it, it's going to cut into my presentation, so I don't get to talk that long. David, thank you. I'm a little embarrassed, uh, but uh, uh, David uh, Truax, Dr. Truax, is a real hero in the city of Covina uh, because he does such a wonderful job uh, with our homeless population person to person. Many people don't want the services, but you have to develop a relationship with each homeless person. And Dave, thank you for the wonderful work you've done in Covina. It's unbelievable what you've done here. I would like to uh, provide my deepest appreciation and thanks to Promise Christian University President, Dr. Mike McKinney, and also Dr. Adele McKinney, uh, as well as uh, the academic dean, Jackie Hornsby. Where are you at, Jackie? Uh, thank you very much to all of you for making the, doing an outstanding job spreading the gospel worldwide uh, with the wonderful Christian ministry education that you're providing to many, many people. So I thank you. Promise Christian University has a proud and distinguished reputation for scholastic excellence, and I would like to provide the teachers and staff of uh, PCU my deepest appreciation for the work you do. Now we do have some graduates here tonight that will be. Walk, will you, how do you? How are you going to do that? Is it going to be virtual or is it's it going to be? Inside, you're going to walk. Inside, great. Walk. I like that. Walk. That's great. To the graduates. Graduating students of PCU, your graduation is a culmination of hard work, those countless hours of lectures, group projects, all-nighters, papers, reports, and presentations as well as exams. In recent months, uh, you've shown tremendous resiliency in a time of tremendous change and with the challenges of the COVID-19 disruption. It's really amazing that you made it during these times uh, in terms of COVID-19. However, you still are you were still able to accomplish your educational goals and I'm extremely proud of each one of the graduates. You will now be joining a long line of acad uh, academics, or should I say alumni, that have made a difference throughout the world and on your graduation day, uh, the sky is not even the limit. You're going to sell, soar very high uh, with your degrees. You know, I'm an unworthy servant of God, doing my part to make the world a better place, and I'm truly honored to be a part of today's ceremony. You know, this past July I turned 70. 70 years old, my God. 
I don't feel like I'm 70. Uh, uh, but you know, I've been so fortunate during those 70 years to be truly blessed with the ability to do a lot of wonderful things and see a lot of wonderful things and really lend a hand to my fellow man. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to speak to high school students and college students about one of my favorite subjects, leadership. I would routinely provide them with examples of individuals who have overcome hardships and adversity and succeed. One of my examples that I would give, I would tell the students about a boy who was born of two teenage parents. His, his, this boy's mom was, was 16 and his father was barely 18 years of age. Neither one of the parents finished high school. And additionally, they resided in a very uh, tough part of Oakland, California, East Oakland, California. That young boy actually flunked the first grade because he didn't have the eyeglasses. His parents couldn't pay for the eyeglasses for him to see the blackboard or read the words in books. Additionally, that young boy missed about two and a half years of school because of a serious illness. But I tell these students that that boy never gave up. He never gave up to the difficulties that he uh, had to endure and that many of us have to endure year after year, day after day. With the help of this boy's parents, his teachers, his professors, those who would become his mentors and his faith in God, he would eventually overcome those hardships and setbacks and succeed. I would conclude my comments by telling those students that that young boy was actually me. I would explain to them that at no time did I ever blame the country, blame others, or make excuses for my difficulties in life, or play the role of victim. Our lives are filled with many trials and tribulations, ups and downs, joyous times and times of great sadness. However, it is our faith, it is our family, it is our friends that are, are to serve as our sanctuary. Those trials and tribulations don't stop, do they? They continue on throughout our entire life. With the help of God, we can move forward, and that's what I've done in my life. I recall being appointed to the Air Force Academy in my senior year of high school. And about one month before I was to attend the academy, I received a letter from the Department of Defense Medical Review Board telling me that I had been medically disqualified because of an eyesight deficiency. I was devastated. To me, as a teenage boy getting ready to move on in life, that was the biggest disappointment at that time that I could ever imagine. My lifetime goal of attending the Air Force Academy and becoming a pilot had been snuffed out. However, we know that in God's plan, when one door closes, another door opens. You know, I decided to continue on. I had not applied to any other colleges. It was too late, so I went to Laney College, Community College in Oakland, trying to find my way. What am I going to do now? I lucked up and got a job as a city planning intern at the city of Oakland. And lo and behold, it helped me get into Cal Poly Pomona's uh, undergraduate program in urban planning. It was only two universities in the entire country that offered a degree in urban planning. I felt that I was going to stand on Mount Olympus and paint all of these beautiful communities and get rid of the, 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 uh, the poor communities and really lay a hand on people in that role. So two years into my college, uh, I, you know, like I said, God is good because I met my wife Patricia and we got married and she would be my wife for the next 38 years. 
We uh, would both graduate from Cal Poly at the same ceremony, and I would become a city planner for the Southern California Association of Governments. In that job, I was bored to death. I sat behind a desk drawing maps, reading, and but I wanted to get out and do something. I wanted to help. I wanted to get on the ground level and help people. And sitting in a city planning office, coloring zoning maps was not my idea of having hands-on hands contact with the people. So I decided to become a police officer. My father said, what the heck, son? You've done all of this education, and now you're going to you're throwing all that college away to become a police officer. What what are you doing? I said, Dad, it's it's something that I want to do because I want to I want to be a protector of society, and I feel that that's the best way that I could do that. Well, later on in life, I would say that I had another major setback. In, in 2009, after three bouts of breast cancer over a 16 year period, I lost my wife Patricia to breast cancer. Again, it was the most devastating loss. She was a wonderful lady. But again, we can get devastated but the Lord says, I'm going to close that door for you, but I'm going to open up another door. Man, I have had a wonderful law enforcement career. That, a, a career that I could have never imagined. And I've been on the city council for 22 years, really being on the ground level to help people. And... The Lord gave me another gift. When I lost my wife, he gave me the gift of helping other spouses that had lost their loved one. And I've been doing that for Citrus, which we used to be Citrus Valley Health Partners, it's now Emanate Health. I do that every year. We get uh, spouses in that have lost a loved one, and I'm able to tell my story about how I got through that misery and moved on with my life when that door, when the Lord opened that door up for me. Now, as was mentioned, uh, I've been in the law enforcement profession now going on 45 years. And as Dave said, I've had a long career doing different things, uh, you know, working, driving a black and white unit around and then working undercover for eight years uh, with major drug traffickers in Mexico and in Los Angeles. I've done all of those things, but now I'm in a position where I'm helping young men and women. These young men and women in their 20s that enter the law enforcement realm. Right now, we have 50 young police recruits in our current academy class from 22 different police departments throughout Orange County, LA County, and Ventura County. Man, I'm where I, the Lord wanted to put me at because this is this is a pinnacle of my career. This is where my career will end one of these days. These cadets go through six long months of rigorous uh, training. Also, this this class has been enduring COVID-19, and the, praise the Lord, we have not had a COVID outbreak. They graduate next month after six months, no outbreaks yet. So we're really happy about that. Uh, these recruits have gone through a lot, uh, and because of the extremely high standards in California, you know, people say, you, you know, police officers are dumb, they don't have, they're uneducated or whatever. Most of our recruits have a college education, college units, master's degrees when they come to us. Did you know that because of the extremely high standards in California, only one out of a hundred applicants will be hired as police officers. Before qualifying to be a police officer, they must pass an oral exam, take a written exam where only about 50% will pass, master a physical agility exam, go through an intensive background investigation, receive a polygraph examination, because there's no secrets when you come into the profession, Go through an eight-hour 
all day long psychological exam and finally take a medical exam to, con to be considered for employment as a candidate for a department and that's before we get them. When we get them, once they enter the academy, they will master 42 different learning domains, including but not limited to constitutional law, criminal law, leadership, uh, professionalism and ethics, community policing, cultural diversity, laws of arrest, rules of evidence, investigative report writing, emergency vehicle operations, firearms training, crimes against people, crimes against children, sex crimes, patrol techniques, advanced first aid and CPR, the use of force and de-escalation training, learning how to interact with the mentally ill and homeless, and several other uh, courses of instruction. I'm extremely concerned for these young men and women that are be going out on the streets in their community, and I pray for their safety and their well-being because presently law enforcement is under siege by many of our elected officials who have advocated their leadership and in some instances turned their leadership over the people that are harming our communities. The George Floyd incident and the Taylor incident were horrible incidents, particularly George Floyd which involve police officers that will pay for their actions. What they did is not a reflection of all police officers. The incident gave law enforcement a huge black eye and it brought undue shame upon my law enforcement profession as a whole. In my 44 years in the law enforcement career, I've never seen anything like I've seen in this day and age. We must, I must tell you that 21st century policing, it, ladies and gentlemen, is driven by crime data. It's driven by crime data and the demands for help from our inner city communities. According to Heather McDonald, the renowned author of War Against Cops, it is the victims' reports that send police officers disproportionately into minority communities because that is where people are being hurt by violent crime. In fact, I have to tell you, after working with thousands of police officers all over the country, throughout the country, I can attest to the fact that a majority of the police officers that I have worked with have not engaged in Epidem act, uh, uh, epidemic uh, uh, racism in law enforcement. George Floyd's death is not representative of the 375 million contacts police officers make with citizens each year. In New York City, blacks make up 73 percent of the shooting victims though they're only 23% of the population. In 2016, 4,300 shooting victims were almost all black shot by black assailants. It is the community's request to, for help that really determines a police department's deployment in a community. And defunding the police is not a wise choice. As a matter of fact, in some communities, they're talking about getting rid of the police. Not a wise choice. The question I'm asking these recent days is, is there a need for enhancement of police services, for police training, for better community relations? I would be lying to you if I said that was not the case. Always, there's always room for improvement. For me and my family and my parents and my ancestors, the 13th Amendment of the Constitution and the Constitution itself, which ended slavery, has significant meaning to me, and I stand before you uh, as a man that has reaped the benefits of these documents. I challenge anyone in this day and age that would claim that our country still owes 
them, our country still owes them for a nation's previous sins, our claims that we live in a nation that is dominated by so-called white privilege and a society that condones racism. Yes, slavery was a hideous criminal act against humanity. Fortunately, the scourge of slavery has long passed and it's time that we live in the present and not languish, languish in the past. Unfortunately, the memories of slavery, along with spotted bouts of horrific ra racism, still plague our nation, like the Charleston, South Carolina shooting, which claimed the lives of nine black Americans during a Bible study. Yes, prejudice does exist, but it is not ingrained in our society. And yes, police officers are prejudiced. However, the prejudice is directed solely towards the criminals and the criminals who harm others and harm our society. With the recent, un recent unfortunate events in our country that is centered around law enforcement, it is by my firm belief that systemic racism does not exist in our profession. I believe that this is a country of good-hearted Americans, and it is a country who the majority believe that if you have faith in God, get a decent education, and work hard, you can be anything you want to be, and I'm a perfect example of that. It is also a country that cares deeply about those in, that need our help. And we have folks like Dave Chuak that comes to their aid. Many of us have friends and good people like Dave Chuak that's always out there helping our fellow man. That is the real beauty of freedom that our Constitution promotes for all of us a constitution that guarantees the absolute freedom of religion and a constitution that promotes freedom of speech without fear. The current attack on these guarantees by the cancel culture must be countered by all of us through cordial dialogue, reasoning, and by the way, the facts. Edwin Burke tells us the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Amen. I would like to ask everyone here this evening to continue standing tall for religious freedom and the right to speak without fear. And last but not least, would you join me in this prayer? Oh God, our Heavenly Father, you have blessed us and given us dominion over all the earth. Increase our reverence before the mystery of life and give us new insight into your purposes of the human race and new wisdom and determination in making provision for its future in accordance with your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Thank you for having me this evening. I really appreciate the honor. And thank you so much. Oh, let's give another round of applause to our our former mayor, council member. Yeah. We'd like to read a hymn from the uh, president and the graduating class of 2020 at Promise Christian University to Mr. Walt Allen, director of the Rio Hondo Police Academy, council member, former mayor of Covina, keynote speaker for 2020 uh, at the 18th annual alumni and in the, in the graduation banquet from yours truly. Thank you, Mr. Allen. We love you and appreciate you. Thank you.
Thank you. Praise the Lord. We appreciate a real great man of God. Amen. Praise the Lord.